we also We were. In progress. Okay, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to the virtual seminar of the International Institute of Physics. And we're starting our second semester of seminars with a talk by Simon White from the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching. So Simon White uh, received his PhD in 1977 from the University of Cambridge. And since then he uh, held numerous positions at many universities, including uh, Berkeley, uh, Cambridge. He was also um, a visitor and, and postdoc in many places in, in the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton and uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, held several research and professorship positions. He is, I think, until now, is, is a professor at the Stewart Observatory of the University of Arizona. And he was the director, a director of the Max Planck Institute in Garching from 1992 until recently. So uh, the main work of Simon is, is on, in uh, formation of structures in, in, uh, in, in the universe. So he, he contributed to establishing the so-called Lambda CDM model, 
which is currently considered as the standard model of uh, cosmic structure. And he, can, he influenced our understanding of formation of galaxies, for example. But for his work, he received many awards and prizes from, uh, from American Physical Society, American Astronomical Society, from uh, Max Born Award from German Physical Society and gold medal from the Royal Astronomical Society. So uh, Simon is also a member of the International Advisory Committee of the International Astrophysics. So we're happy to see you here, Simon, at our virtual seminar. Thank you very much for agreeing to give us a talk. And uh, the word is yours. Can you see everything okay? Yes. Well, I'm very glad to be here, at least virtually. Uh, for some reason, I've had very bad luck with the timing of the meetings of the advisory committee, so I still haven't actually managed to visit the Institute, despite having been on the committee for a number of years now. But I'm still hopeful that uh, I'll be able to come soon, hopefully as soon as the current pandemic uh, is uh, relaxed again and we can travel once more. So today I'd like to talk about uh, Mondays I'll be going on natural structures that may be present in the universe. And these are, we think, likely to be dark matter structures with no baryonic material associated to them. And you might wonder why we should even care. And one possible reason is that they may contribute significantly to the total amount of uh, visible radiation through annihilation if dark matter is indeed a particle which can annihilate. But let me begin by talking first my, about the astrophysical evidence for dark matter and why we believe in it. And if you look at popular accounts or even most undergraduate or even graduate textbooks, they always start by talking about rotation curves of galaxies. And this I think is incorrect. The first evidence for dark matter came from clusters of galaxies long before uh, rotation curves for galaxies were measured, almost 40 years earlier. And it was until the end, the strongest evidence in the present day universe until maybe the last 20 years. But today, in any, in any case, the strongest evidence for dark matter doesn't come from the nearby universe at all, but rather from the microwave background radiation, which is showing us the universe at the time it was only a few hundred thousand years old. So very much younger than it is today. And what you're seeing on the left here, a power spectrum measured by the Planck satellite of the variations in temperature and polarization in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And the plot at the top is the power spectrum of the fluctuations in temperature. So the Fourier transform of the distribution of temperature on the sky with uh, long wavelengths on the left short wavelengths on the right. And what you see is a very clear pattern. And this pattern is actually extremely weak. The amplitude of the temperature fluctuations we're talking about are about one part in, uh, or a few parts in, in 100,000. So they're very weak uh, fluctuations, but nevertheless, they can be measured very accurately. And their structure as recorded in the power spectrum can be measured now very accurately as you see here, because you can see the error bars on the points at the left, but that's actually because we only have a few modes to measure, not because they're measured poorly. And to the right, where there are many modes contributing to each bin in this power spectrum, you cannot even see the error bars any longer on these points. So the top panel, as I say, is the autocorrelation function of the uh, temperature fluctuations. The middle panel here is the cross correlation or the cross power spectrum between the fluctuations in temperature and the polarization of the radiation, which is caused by the scattering of the last, uh, in the last surface when the universe uh, re recombined. And the lower panel is the autocorrelation of the fluctuations in polarization. So these three power spectra actually are independent in a statistical sense, and they contain the full information in the fluctuation field, as long as it can be thought of as a Gaussian random field. And as far as we know, all indications are that this is an extremely good approximation. No, no deviation for Gaussianity has been found so far. And as you see, there is very good signal to noise in all three of these power spectra. And you can see there is a blue curve 
which goes through all of them. And this blue curve is an a priori theoretical model with just six parameters, which is the current standard lambda CDM model. And because the error bars are so small, these parameters are measured with very high precision, as you can see here from these numbers in the table. For example, the top number here is the, is the baryon density of the universe today in units of the critical density, and it's measured to better than 1%. And the second line is the one which concerns dark matter. This is the present density of non-baryonic matter, or matter that does not inter interact uh, uh, electromagnetically, but only gravitationally. And this is seen, is also measured to be uh, at the 1% level. And you can see that it's about five or six times more important than the baryonic matter. And this is all measured at the time of recombination when the universe was only 350,000 years old. And the other parameters here are also of interest, but um, I won't go through them today. And these are other parameters derived from these six. So this is the six parameters which have been adjusted to get this extraordinarily good fit are not actually fitting parameters, they're actually physical parameters. And the values that come out are actually measurements, the measurements of baryon density, the cold dark matter density, the initial conditions of which came out from the very early universe and some properties of the late time universe. So why should we believe these? Well, these are results from a single instrument. This, uh, the entire, all these measurements are taken from a single instrument, the high frequency instrument on the Planck satellite, although they agree essentially perfectly with earlier but less precise measurements taken with earlier satellites. And this, these numbers come purely from these measurements. Actually, no local or low redshift data at all are used to get the numbers I'm showing you in this table. So we don't even need to look at, at the, the late time universe around us to get these measurements of what the content of the universe was at that time. And then because the fluctuations are such small amplitude, what we're seeing here are, are linear perturbations of an almost homogeneous medium. So this is linear theory is something which physicists know how to do extremely well. And so there are no complicated nonlinear aspects in setting up this pattern. And indeed, the physics that's responsible for setting up the pattern uh, that we see, the late stage pattern, is actually all essentially low temperature physics at temperatures of these dilute gases at temperatures of a few thousand to a few hundred thousand degrees. Furthermore, this physics at the time it's acting, at the time we see this pattern, is outside the regime where modified theories of gravity as a thought uh, sometimes argued to affect the local dark matter density. And so th these theories have no effect on the pattern we see here. And so this pattern is established and gives you these parameters independent of this possible modifications of gravity. So for all these reasons, I think this is extraordinarily well established with measurements at the 1% level. However, to talk about the structure today requires extrapolation both to much smaller scales than are, than are measured here. These, even the smallest scales seen in this map are much larger than the scales which make galaxies. But also, of course, extrapolation to much later times when the nonlinear effects are very strong because after all, galaxies are extremely nonlinear objects. So if we ask in the late universe, how can we tell this picture is correct? Well, we can simulate forwards the evolution from this early time to the present day numerically. And for the dark matter, which is the dominant component, it's only affected by gravity. And so these simulations can be carried out with, well, with a fairly high degree of precision. So what's shown here is a comparison between uh, the distribution of, this is, this, is a, this is a picture of gravitational lensing. So what you're seeing horizontally here is scale, the projected scale on the sky going from one megaparsec here, well, or actually down here about 30 kiloparsecs. So that's a bit larger than the size of a galaxy out by a factor of a thousand in scale. And what's plotted vertically is the surface density measured by gravitational lensing effects. So there's, there's the lensing effects on objects which are behind the, the, the galaxies that we're, we're, we're considering. And these different curves are looking at the average effect around galaxies of different stellar mass. So you, we can see the galaxies, we can measure their mass in stars. The highest curve is, is for the most massive in the individual galaxies. 
and the red curve here is the lowest mass individual galaxies. And galaxies like our own would be essentially the green, like the green curve here. So the black curve corresponds to galaxies which are much more massive than our galaxy by more than a factor of 10. So if you take isolated galaxies of different masses and stuck the gravitational lensing signal around them, you can measure the mass, average mass profile surrounding galaxies out to very large radii. And so the measurements are shown by these different colored symbols and the different colors correspond to the different masses of the object that we're stacking around. So those are the direct measurements from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The curves here are a model and this model is, is, is a model for how galaxies should form inside the dark matter that's been simulated directly. And this is, has to, obviously has to deal with the process of galaxy formation, which is very nonlinear and very uncertain. So the modeling of the galaxy formation has had to have parameters adjusted. But the parameters that were adjusted in the galaxy formation model uh, were fit only to, uh, to, to uh, fit by using the abundances of galaxies as a function of their mass their star formation rates, their characteristic velocities and so on. No information was used in the fitting about the distribution of matter or about the distribution of the galaxies in space. And so in that sense, this uh, test here has no additional free parameters. After those parameters were fit to fit the galaxy abundances, no further parameters were adjusted to predict the lensing signal. And so you can see here how well this model is predicting the average distribution of matter around galaxies today as a function of their mass. For galaxies of very different masses and over a, fa a factor of about a thousand in spatial scale. So I think this is very strong evidence that the dark matter distribution today does correspond to what we see in the microwave background uh, at high redshift, just amplified by gravitational uh, clustering. And of course, extrapolated down to the much smaller scales which are necessary to make these predictions. So the predicted and observed profiles agree down to Milky Way mass, certainly the green curve, and then below that it becomes too noisy to say much. So this model, if we ask, where is the dark matter predicted to be today? What mass objects is it supposed to be in? This is a, project, uh, a, 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 a plot the fraction of all dark matter in the universe which is predicted to be diffuse is, is, is diffuse. Is the prediction of that as a function of the characteristic overdensity uh, measured on the scale. So on very large scales, the characteristic overdensity in the present day universe is very small. On very small scales, this is in the initial conditions, because the fluctuation of smaller scales are larger than large scales, the fluctuation is quite large. And so as you go to larger amplitudes here that corresponds to less and less small smoothing of the dark matter distribution, you see more and more objects and less and less of the material is diffuse. And if you apply, this is a model, a simplified model for the formation of dark matter halos, which are the nonlinear objects, dark matter objects today, that was set out by Press and Schechter in the 1970s, then you get this curve and objects like galaxy clusters are here so if you could only see the galaxy clusters, they only account for roughly 15% of the dark matter and the other 85% is still diffuse. But if you come down to 10 to the 12 solar masses, which is about the dark matter mass associated with our galaxy, then that is roughly half of all the dark matter is in, in, in non-linear objects more massive than the dark matter halo around the Milky Way. If you go down to the least massive halos that are, contain any stars at all that we can see, which is somewhere around 10 to the nine solar masses, that accounts for about 75%. So the halos of galaxies, if you include even the very smallest ones, can seem to contain about 75% of the dark matter, according to this theoretical model. But there should be smaller mass objects because if the dark matter is cold dark matter, then the natural limiting scale is about the mass of the earth. This depends on the nature of the dark matter, but if for example, it was a wimp uh, with a, uh, a mass scale of hundred GeV or so, um, as, as, like the lightest supersymmetric particle might be, then the characteristic scale is predicted to be around an earth mass. So there should be smaller mass halos all the way down to earth mass. And this is about 95% by then. So you see, the amount of material which is truly diffuse is quite small because 
these halos that are defined to be regions where the average density is roughly 100 times the cosmic mean. So the, the, the in characteristic dynamical times are short compared to the age of the universe. So that means even if all the mass were in such halos, they would only occupy about a 1% of the volume. So if 95% of the mass is occupying 1% of the volume, the other 99% of the volume is filled with the remaining 5%. And so the density of space between the halos has to be, of the dark matter has to be very small, less than 5% of the cosmic mean. So we can ask whether the dark matter could produce detectable radiation today. So and is, we, can we see it in some way other than just by its gravitational effects? And there are two channels which, where this could occur. One is if the dark matter is not absolutely stable and so could decay. It has to decay extremely slowly or we would have seen it a long time ago. But nevertheless, if it has uh, some finite decay rate, then the decay can produce continuum or line emission depending on the exact channel. And a few years ago, there was, there was claimed to find uh, an X-ray line at three and a half kilovolts in galaxy clusters, which appeared to be diffuse and coming from between the galaxies. And this caused some excitement because this could, could be due to the decay of a sterile neutrino of a mass around seven kV, which would be decaying to other neutrinos and uh, some photons. Now, as I say, this caused a lot of excitement. There was a lot of controversy about it. But now the, the more recent measurements seem to exclude, exclude this very strongly. So here, here are measurements from uh, earlier this year, you can see this from 2021, which has taken, has taken all sky measurements and along every line of sight, we should see, be seeing the decay of dark matter in the halo of the Milky Way. And because we know roughly the distribution of the dark matter within the Milky Way's halo, we know the relative amounts of material that should be coming from different directions on the sky, so that, that we know the relative amounts, column densities of material along each line of sight. And so we can predict the relative amounts of radiation which should be coming from the decay of material along each line of sight. So then if you stack them at around three and five kV, then this is the stacked signal from uh, these, uh, these data. And if there, was, if there was decay at the strength claimed from galaxy clusters, the line should have looked like the dashed line here. And there are two different instruments here. So you can see in either, in either case here for both instruments, the signal appears to be very smooth, effectively a power law, and there's no sign of a signal, even a, a, tiny, a small fraction as strong as what would be needed to explain the clusters. So it seems that the, the kind of radiation that have been claimed is strongly excluded by these data. So there might, of course, still be some decay radiation, but it's just, it just has to be at a much lower level to be consistent with this. So whatever the three and a half kV line was, if it's real, it has to be something else. So the next possibility is that the particles could be stable, but they could be, uh, they could be their own antiparticles. So then the, if two particles run into each other, there's a finite uh, cross section for annihilation. And this is the case, for example, for Susie Wimps. So in the, in, in the, in the simpler supersymmetric theories that are consistent, uh, currently with current limits, there is a, a finite uh, probability for annihilation of, of the WIMPs. And so, and though this could, would also produce continuum or line radiation, depending on the various annihilation channels, which would be in the gamma ray range. And here, there is actually a signal which could be due to this. So this is now from the Fermi satellite. And now we're looking at um, uh, um, radiation in the... Uh, in the GeV range, one to 10 GeV. And this is the surface brightness measured as a dis distance of angle on the sky from the center of our Milky Way. And the stars here are the measured signal. So you can see, that, and the, these are the most recent ones and the other, other error bars here are from older measurements. So you can see there are very small error bars here. This is, I think now 15 years of Fermi data stacked. And there is, uh, a signal detected all the way from half a degree out to 15 degrees or so. 
somewhere out here. So over well over an order of magnitude in, in, in spatial scale. And if you predict the, kind, the shape of the signal that would be expected from dark matter radiation and just adjust the normalization, that's what this blue curve is. So you can say, see that there, there, there really does appear to be a signal there, which is more or less the right shape in terms of its dependence on distance from the center. It's also the more or less the right shape that it looks to be roughly circularly distributed around the center. It's not confined to the plane of the Milky Way, for example, as it would be if it was due to stars lying in the disk of the Milky Way. So it's unclear what this radiation is. It's clearly detected, but it may not be due to a, a dark matter annihilation. People have been very cautious because there are other, many other sources of gamma radiation, and it's difficult to exclude that this is due to, to, to something else. So perhaps annihilation has been detected. If annihilation is detected in the luminosity of any dark matter halo will be proportional to the mass of material in it, the mass of dark matter, but it'll also be proportional to its average density because the annihilation depends on the, on the density of other particles surrounding each particle. So the scaling you expect is the, uh, the luminosity and annihilation radiation from a halo should go like the halo's mass times its mean density. So this means that if you look across uh, halos of very different masses, the luminosity will tend to be biased towards the high density halos, which tend to be the lower mass objects. It's been known ever since people have been simulating the formation of dark matter structures that lower mass objects tend to have form at earlier times in the universe and to have higher average densities. So this biases the luminosity towards the lower mass objects. So if we ask now what would, could we see uh, from looking from the center of the Milky Way, this is a prediction from 2008, which until recently was the best prediction so far of what we might expect to see from uh, on the gamma ray sky as seen from the sun's position inside our own Milky Way for the annihilation radiation of the Milky Way, assuming it does uh, uh, annihilate. So the annihilation luminosity coming from any particular volume element or any particular object is some particle physics factor which depends on the annihilation channels, where the, this is where the particle physics comes in, times the volume element times the square of the density of the dark matter. So you can see this separates neatly into a particle physics part and an astrophysics part. So if halos all look the same, then this integral can be written as the mass of the object times a mean density. And if you think of, a, of, of an object having, a, say, a galaxy sitting inside a dark matter halo, with a disk which is in circular motion around its center, then you can measure the rotation curve, which is the orbital speed of the stars in the disk around the center of the galaxy as a function of distance for it. And that typically is small at the center, rises to a peak at some radius and then drops. And so if, if, if halos were all uh, uh, the same shape, so they were homologous to each other, then this scaling corresponds to the maximum of this circular velocity squared to the fourth power divided by the radius at which it's, it's attained. This scaling is useful because these particular parameters are very easy to measure in numerical simulations. And so you can use this to, to get a proxy for the luminosity of halos where you can't see the detailed structure well enough to uh, do this integral in a more direct way. So what's been done here is this is the emission from as seen from the sun, so this is a map of the whole sky, is the annihilation emission as seen from the sun due to the smooth part of the distribution of the dark matter in this simulated dark matter halo. And you can see it's very strongly concentrated towards the galactic center and drops away from it in a smooth way. So that's one component. But there are also many smaller lumps of dark matter orbiting inside the main halo of the Milky Way and each of those has its own local concentration and will produce its own local additional annihilation radiation. And this is for this simulation, the predicted annihilation from all the subhalos that were actually resolved numerically in the simulation. And it has been, uh, uh, it's been 
uh, estimated using this, this scaling relation because the halos are too small to see their internal structure very, very well, but you can estimate quite accurately these two parameters. And so if you assume they all look similar, then you can use that to make this plot. And you can see they almost uniformly distributed over the sky. And that's because most of these objects are actually much farther from the center of the Milky Way than, than the sun is. And so when we look from the sun's position, we see them almost equally in all directions. But now the third contribution here is an extrapolation estimating what the radiation would be from halos, which were much smaller than, than which we think should be there, but which were smaller than the resolution limit of the simulation. And so you can see this produces something which is, has a slight concentration towards the center of the galaxy, but it's very diffuse. And actually the total radiation in this panel is larger than the other two. So if you add the three together, you get this plot. So the conclusion in 2008 was that Milky Way's annihilation flux could be dominated by the flux from totally unresolved small subhalos. But since this would be uniform over the sky, it might be very difficult to detect. On the other hand, the flux in the galactic center dominates that from the resolved subhalos by a very large factor. If you look at this combined map, you easily see the center of the, of the Milky Way, but it's very hard to see these smaller objects which correspond to the other smaller subhalos. But the relative detectability in practice depends on how many confusing signals there are. So actually the community has spent most of its time, even after this was published, going after these small things and ignoring the thing in the middle, which as I showed you is, is detected very well, but could perhaps be due to something else. So here's a plot showing how these numbers are arrived at. So the horizontal plot line here is distance from the center of the simulated Milky Way. So the sun would be at eight kiloparsecs from the center. So it would be here. So this is very close to the center. This is very far out. The edge of, of the Milky Way's halo is conventionally taken to be where this dashed line is. So if you take the total mass in the simulation and plot it cumulatively, so in terms of units of the total mass, which is here at zero, then you get this blue curve. And you can see that actually it's rising rather slowly. Only a few percent of the mass is actually inside the position of the sun. Most of it's outside the sun. And 50% of it, so 50% of the total mass is reached at about 80 or 90 kiloparsecs here. So very far out. Now we can make a similar cumulative plot for the luminosity from each volume element. And since the luminosity of each volume element depends on the, pro the, the product of the mass in it times its local density, this weights the center much more strongly. So now the cumulative curve is the red curve. So you can see the half luminosity point is actually predicted to be inside. This is for the smooth component only. It's predicted to be inside the sun at about roughly a third of the distance of the sun from the center. So those are the smooth component and the smooth component has a very concentrated uh, luminosity distribution as you saw visually in the last plot. But now if we look at the subhalo, We only have which are more massive, very well resolved in this simulation. And plot up their cumulative luminosity as a function of distance from the center. We get this thin green curve, the lowest one. The simulation could resolve much, uh, much better than that. So now we reduce the limit and consider all halos more massive than 10 to the seven solar masses. Then this curve has moved up. You take all halos more massive than 10 to the six solar masses. It's moved up to get again. And if we take all halos more massive than the actual resolution limit of the simulation, which is around 10 to the five, you get this thick green curve. So you can see this is rising actually even more slowly or even faster towards the outside than the, the value for the mass. And that's because most of the subhalos are at large distances because the ones near the middle got tidally destroyed by the, by the strong gravitational field of the Milky Way. But the problem is this last curve is 10 to the five so all the masses, we believe the limiting mass in truth should be at one earth mass or 10 to the minus six solar masses. So we have to continue this progression upwards by another 11 orders of magnitude. So if you do that, you can see these look more or less as though they're parallel. So if you do this, assuming you can just shift these up, keeping parallel, and you can see if you shift, this is just uh, 
here has shifted by three orders of magnitude. So we shift up by another 11 orders of magnitude. You'll see the total luminosity is completely dominated by these small objects, which is where the conclusion came from. But the question is, is it correct? Is this extrapolation correct? And in any case, this simulation only included the, the, non, the cold dark matter. How are things affected by the fact that our galaxy actually has baryons in it? So the rest of my talk, I want to address separately these two questions. So here's a simulation to address the question of what the structure of the smallest objects really is. So what you're seeing here is a relatively thin, thin slice. So a, a standard cosmological simulation, you can see it's about 500 megaparsecs across. And uh, this is the distribution of dark matter predicted by evolution at the present day, predicted by evolution from the initial conditions uh, seen in the Planck satellite. And you can see the large scale structure of the universe shown here. And the brightest objects you see, these little points of light here, would correspond to clusters of galaxies. So now what's been done in this simulation is to take a region here inside some circle. So in fact, we take a spherical region in this cubic simulation box. And inside this resolution, this, this, then we redo the simulation, increasing the resolution inside this small region by a factor of a thousand and decreasing the resolution everywhere else by a large factor. And then we run it again. So the lower resolution on the outside produces the correct tidal effects on this region. And inside the region, we can see the structure in a thousand times better detail. And the result of doing that then looks like this. So here's the boundary of the region. It's not actually a sphere. And now you can see this was a low density region. The biggest objects now are, correspond to something a bit larger than the halo of our own Milky Way. So now we can do this trick again. Inside this region, we can pick a spherical, re this simulation, we can pick a spherical region, which has relatively low density and avoids any of the most massive objects. And then we can rerun the simulation, refining the resolution here by another factor of a thousand, and decreasing the resolution here so that it remains enough to get the tidal effects correct, but otherwise we're not following the details. And then we can do it again. And then it looks like this. And now the most massive objects you here, see here correspond to the most massive objects that would host any stars at all, any galaxy with stars. And a region like this has no objects in it that are predicted to, to, to host stars. So now again, we can take a spherical region, do this again, and again, and again. So now look at the size of the region here. This region is now only five kiloparsecs. So if this, you know, if we put the center at the Milky Way, then the sun would be here. But of course, this is way outside any, any dark halo, so it's nowhere near the Milky Way. You can keep going. Again. And again. So now, at this stage, the, these things like these knots are actually Earth mass. So we actually see the lowest mass dark halos because we've been looking at regions where the bigger halos have not formed. And because we keep recentering the, the, the res resolution region in regions where there are no massive objects, there's not much mass left in this region. So the average density in this region is only 3% of the cosmic mean. This is just the effect that I pointed out to you earlier. So this, we called this simulation voids and voids and voids because we, don't, didn't, we kept re-simulating regions which avoided the most massive objects in order to be able to see things at much higher resolution. So if you, these are the different levels I just went through. This is the typical size. So this was the distance across the first simulation in megaparsecs. Down here, you can see across the final simulation, it's 240 parsecs. There's a factor of uh, whatever it is, uh, of more than a million here in scale. The individual particles which are being used to represent the dark matter were 10 to the 10 solar masses in the initial simulation. Sorry, the number of, sorry, this is the number of particles. There were 10 to the 10 particles to represent the dark matter here and a few, and a few times 10 to the nine particles at the end. But the mass of the individual particles has decreased. Mm -hmm.
from about 10 to the nine solar masses to 10 to the minus 11 solar masses. So that's 20 orders of magnitude change, an improvement in the resolution. And the scale on which the gravity is being resolved has gone from a few kiloparsecs to a few times the size of the solar system. And the mean density of the region has gone from being the average density to being 3% of the average density, as I told you. So now if we look at the properties of the smallest objects, the typical objects where we can measure the structure in these simulations relatively well go from being 10 to the 14 solar masses, the first level, to about Earth mass, the lower mass. So we can measure the structure of objects over 20 orders of magnitude in mass. And if you ask, you know, what is the typical object uh, redshift when these particular objects formed, then the clusters formed at a redshift below one today. And if you look, as you go to smaller objects, the redshift at which they form increases up to a certain point, but then it goes down again. And so the smallest objects actually don't form as far in the past as expected. And this increase in formation time is smaller than was expected. So now, if we ask whether their radial structure looks the same, this is a plot to compare in a dimensionless way the radial structure of the objects. So objects plotted here cover 19 orders of magnitude in halo mass and four orders of magnitude in density. But the mean density profiles, and you plot them in this uh, dimensionless way, so what's plotted here is the logarithmic slope of the, of the density as a function of radius, so d log rho by d log r, as a function of the radius in terms of a particular characteristic radius. And what you can see is when you plot it this way, the curves all, which are the thick curves here, all lie on top of each other. So they're all the same. And you can fit a standard curve through them with an error bar, which, with, which you know, which fits this quite well. So if you take this standard fitting relation, let me just for brevity focus on the lower one, which is the best fit. This is a two parameter fitting function and it fits the, these curves to with a few percent over the full mass range. So this kind of, uh, this fitting function is known as an Inasto profile with a particular value of its parameters. And so it fits these curves to within 7%. And so as long as curves are, are self-similar as these seem to be, then we can use the fitting function to evaluate the coefficient in this integral. So we can say that the uh, annihilation radiation of a dark matter halo is, it, is given by the particle physics component times its maximum circular velocity to the fourth power over its, the radius at which that's attained, the one power with g squared and this factor. And the factor just comes from this profile shape. And this seems to fit across the full mass range of 19 orders of magnitude. So people in the field usually talk about these things in terms of the concentration versus the mass. And this is a measure of the density. And this is the concentration. So denser halos have larger values of concentration, so higher. So this is concentration versus mass for all these different simulations. A fitting function here is the solid curve. You can see the concentration increases until you approach the limiting mass and then it actually goes down again. And these, extrapolations which have been used in the literature previously based on the properties at high mass where things were simulated. And you can see a power law fit to this mass range does very badly. In fact, it gets things off by factors of up to a thousand. And that's shown here. We ask what's the predicted annihilation radiation. So if you take the number of expected halos and multiply them by the annihilation luminosity to get the total annihilation luminosity of halos as a function of their mass, as of their mass, over now this is 20 orders of magnitude in mass. And you can see what's sound here, there's over a very wide mass range, this is roughly flat. So there's equal annihilation uh, luminosity coming from halos in each mass range. Whereas previous formulae went off the top of the plot for many of them. There was only one published curve which came close. So the total numerosity is, is lower than previously estimated by factors of about a three between three and a thousand. But 
that's still so that sounds that this is now a way to deal with the the fact that we need to extrapolate over such a large range of matter. You now actually have a simulation which follows structure of over the full mass range. But now we have to address the fact of how things are affected by the baryons. And this is done in this paper, which I did with a postdoc, Rob Gran, he's up here. And these took simulations of the formation of an object like the Milky Way. And it had six simulations of Milky Way formation in the standard model with a dark matter mass and baryonic mass of these values is the resolution of the simulation. And each one was that run twice, once using the full physics of the baryons, the star formation, the feedback, the formation of the black hole, black hole feedback, and all the, all the other physics we think we need to make galaxies, to, to make something which looked realistic. And the other was exactly the same initial conditions, but followed the dark matter only. And in each simulation, a large enough region was simulated that you could look at, 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 the, sur at the, surrounding the, the surroundings of the central Milky Way and see what small objects look like in a field environment. So for the large objects in these simulations, we could use the, the standard formula to analyze the luminosity directly, estimating the densities by voronoi tessellating the, the particle distributions. For small objects, we could use this scaling relation by fitting the density profiles or the circular velocity curves of the individual objects to the Inasto formula. So first thing we can ask is how is the structure of dark matter of small dark matter halos, the ones we're worried about, affected by the baryons? So this is showing the two scaling parameters we're worried about, the radius and the characteristic velocity and in the horizontal direction. The vertical direction is the ratio of the radius in the full physics case with baryons to the radius when the baryons are neglected. And here the velocity in the full physics case to the velocity in the case when the baryons are neglected. So you can see there's quite a lot of scatter, particularly in this plot. The median though is relatively close to zero in this case. But if you go to low masses, which is where we're going to need to extrapolate, you can see that when you put in the baryons, the small mass halos actually become somewhat bigger and their velocities go down. And that's because for very small halos, the baryons don't fall in. And so they don't have the baryonic mass inside them. There's less to hold them together. So they have less mass and they expand slightly. So they get slightly bigger and the characteristic velocities go down. So when you put these things into the scaling relations for the luminosity, you find their annihilation luminosity is dropped by about a factor of two below what you would predict just from the dark matter only case. You can ask how they affect the uh, relations between uh, V max and, oops, between the maximum velocity and the radius when you are inside a dark matter halo. So like for the sub halos surrounding the Milky Way. So now the, the right panel is what we had before. These are the field halos outside the main halo and the dark matter only case, so this is plotting R max against V max. And the median relation is the black curve here in the dark matter case. And this is the relation that came from the VVV simulation I showed you. And you can see over the well-resolved range, this essentially perfect agreement. But when you put in the baryons, this shifts upwards. So at a given V max, R max is slightly bigger. This is a combination of the effects I showed you before. Now if we compare to subhalos, then what you can see is now dotted curves, the dots are in the same place here, you can see they've shifted downwards. So both relations, both for the dark matter only and for the case including the baryons are lower. So at a given uh, circular velocity, things are smaller. So you can think of that as them being tidally stripped when they're inside a major halo. And so now the black curve is well below the red dots and the green curve is actually now also below the red dots. So both relations are shifted down. So if you ask how this affects the annihilation luminosities, this is equivalent to the plot I showed you before. So the plot I showed you before was equivalent to this, these black curves. So this is the mean annihilation luminosity from the main halo, which is uh, half of it's inside four kiloparsecs here. And this is from the subhalos. 
and they're rising upwards. And by the time you get to the simulation limit, there's almost as much luminosity in the subhalos as in, in the main halo. But now if we add the baryons and compare the baryonic case, the baryons pull the dark matter towards the center of the Milky Way. So the smooth component is now more luminous. You can see the green curve has shifted up by a factor of three. So the smooth component has become more luminous and the subhalo components have become less luminous. And that's two effects. It's one that the, the sizes and velocities have dropped, but the other is that because the, the, the main potential well has become stronger, the tidal disruption effects are more significant. So the result is the contrast between the, the, the main component and the subhalos has increased dramatically by about a factor of 30. So if you, this is just to show you visually. So this is what, if you project the dark matter run, would look like this is the same, same initial conditions but with the full physics. And you can see that the cooling and condensation of gas to make the main galaxy has made the, the dark matter more concentrated towards the center. It's made the distribution rounder and it's decreased the luminosities of the typical satellites. So I think for interests of time, this is now, well, let me just briefly show this. So this is showing how you can extrapolate now to the lowest masses by using the results that I showed you from the VVV function uh, simulation. So here, for example, these are the field halos. This is the number of halos as a function of the maximum circular velocity and only halos down to somewhere around here would actually have any stars at all. And the simulations, you can see their resolution causes them to fail. So they just don't see the, low, the, the smallest objects. So now if we take curves as predicted from the simulation I showed you before, at the higher masses, there's good agreement and we can fit them to the slope here and then use that to extrapolate. So that's what I'm going to do. This is now doing the same for the subhalos. And again, you can see these curves fit at the higher masses. They can be used to extrapolate to the lower masses. So this allows us to now extrapolate for the very small objects, which could not be seen directly in the simulation. So now we ask what's the, the number of objects as a function of their annihilation luminosity. So for the field halos, this doesn't shift very much between the dark matter only in black and the full physics in green. They go down a little bit. But you can see it's gone down substantially for the um, case where the, uh, for the subhalos inside the main galaxy. So now if we ask what will we see from the sun's position, this is now just plotting the flux of small objects in units of the flux of the main component of the Milky Way <coughs> we're plotting the cumulative number of these objects as a function of their flux relative to the flux of the Milky Way. So you can see in uh, the dark matter only case, some objects we were occasionally predicted to get an object which was a few percent of the flux the, of the main component. And the typical case here was about uh, 3%, uh, point, sorry, 0.3 percent. <coughs> But now because of these effects from including the baryons, the green curve has shifted to the right. So now the typical object is predicted only to have about uh, 0.003 of the main halo. So, uh, sorry, 2.0002 of the flux. So let me come to my conclusions to wrap up here because we're getting to the end. So. Question, so what, we, what you can conclude from this is that the brightest object is expected to be about two times 10 to the minus four of the central object. So you know, we're gonna see the central object long before we see and be convinced that it's dark matter annihilation well long before we see anything else. If we ask, does, do the simulations fit the Fermi results? Well, this is the Fermi curve I showed you earlier. And these are the halos that I've been talking about in the full physics run. You can see how well the shape fits from about half a degree out to 20 degrees here. And actually we have one better resolved halo, which uh, fitted even better, although this turned out to be a fluke. 
So I think the conclusion from this, so this conclusion is the same as the as De Mauro 21 made himself, that it could well be we have seen the dark matter. So the conclusion is that baryonic effects substantially enhance and concentrate the predicted radiation from the uh, predicted annihilation luminosity from the main Milky Way halo, but they reduce the luminosity predicted for the smaller subhalos with characteristic velocities below say 50 kilometers a second corresponding to small dwarf galaxies or things with no stars at all. And the enhanced mass concentration of the Milky Way caused by the baryons making the stars of the Milky Way causes an enhanced tidal disruption of satellites, especially in the inner regions, and that further reduces the luminosities, the fluxes predicted from small objects. So the expected ratio of the flux of the brightest subhalo on the whole sky to that of the main halo goes down by almost a factor of 30 to about two times 10 to the minus four. So my conclusion from this is, is we're never gonna detect any subhalo before we detect the main halo of the Milky Way if annihilation radiation is indeed present. And uh, the conclusion also is that previous work on this problem has greatly overestimated the relative contribution from very small subhalos, and this was because it overestimated their densities. And finally, I think, you know, the Fermi excess really could be annihilation radiation, so perhaps we've seen the dark matter already. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, so uh, let's see if we have any questions at this time. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand or, or uh, write in the chat. So meanwhile, I'll probably ask the first question. So as far as I understand this, uh, the Fermi uh, satellite, they, they measure some uh, excess uh, directly, right? That's, that's experimental measurement. Yeah. Yes. And but in, in the first curve, in the first plot, when, when you discussed this result, this, this experimental result, there was a curve that you showed that uh, sort of was was more or less following the experimental results. Is it is it uh, some earlier estimates before the, your work on uh, estimating the effect of the sub halos and, and small halos or? So I, I, I didn't understand how this is, how your result, let's say, is compared. My results to don't affect those conclusions because the model they were using to estimate the dark matter contribution previously is quite a good fit to our own results because it was only concentrating on the smooth component. So the uh, pre other people using the Fermi satellite in the past have concentrated for trying to find the uh, radiations, for example, from dwarf galaxies, individual dwarf galaxies surrounding the Milky Way, with the argument that they might be less affected by contaminating radiation. So the the, rel the what the, our results what our results have changed is predicted ratio of the flux from these smaller objects to the flux from the main component centered on the galactic center, which is about more than an order of magnitude lower, according to our estimates, than a previously been uh, assumed. And so this makes it even less likely that you'll find one of the smaller objects before you've been able to confirm that what we see from the galactic center region is in fact annihilation radiation. Okay, uh, so there's a question from uh, Anne Green. I know Anne, uh, can, you, can you ask a question yourself or do you want me to read it? Um, I guess I can ask it myself. So, um... The low concentrations of the micro halos, is that a consequence of the fact they're forming relatively late? And then also, would you expect to see something different from micro halos that aren't formed in voids, that are formed, say, in more typical regions? Uh, yes, there is a tight link between the concentration and the formation time. If you go back and look at our paper, you'll find the table, which went by fairly quickly, has the, well, actually, I did point it out in the talk too, has the formation times listed. And if you uh, typically, and if you look there, you'll see they don't get to be very high. They don't get, get much higher than redshift five, even for the lowest mass objects. And they actually get lower again for the lowest mass objects, which are close to the free streaming cutoff. So I think uh, the question about whether 
this would be significantly different from microhalos in endonuclease regions? That is an important question. So the extent to which we could address it was by checking in each of the levels of the simulation, we could check at each level whether the concentration of the halos at that level depended on the environment over the range we could resolve. And that was typically a factor of 10 or 30 in environment density. We found no significant dependence of the concentration of small objects on the environment in which they were found. So um, I think, I mean, the difference, the main difference was earlier work was the earlier work mostly, uh, it, it didn't take account of the fact that small halos today have to be formed in regions which are very low density compared to the mean cosmic density today. Because, and so people previously had tried to run simulations by simulating moderate sized regions at the mean cosmic density. And then they always had to stop their simulation long before they got to the present day because it went completely nonlinear. And that corresponds to the fact that the things they saw, which formed at high redshift, would actually almost all have been incorporated in larger objects by redshift zero. Whereas the way we did the simulation, we were able to simulate all the regions down to redshift zero. And so, you know, we were seeing regions, uh, objects which are in undense regions, but we were at least seeing them at redshift zero. And then I guess the, I guess the, uh, the way this comes into the substructure of things that come before really is, is it comes in through the, the mass circular velocity relation, because that's, as you saw from the scaling, the annihilation goes as V to the fourth, o, luminosity goes V to the fourth over R. So it's really how that relation depends on mass, which is, be, is what's being used to extrapolate to smaller scales. Okay, thanks. I mean, that all makes sense, but I guess to some extent the microhalos which end up in the Milky Way are going to be ones that weren't formed in voids, so... That's correct, but most, uh, well, no, they were formed in lower density regions, but most, don't forget that most of the microhalos, I mean, if you look at simulations, for example, there was very nice simulations done uh, three or four years ago now by uh, Raoul Angelo, Oliver Hahn and colleagues, uh, looking at the growth of things. And they, they found things which, first of all, didn't have NFW uh, profiles, and uh, secondly, had quite high densities. But if you look at their objects, they were all growing, they, at the time they had to stop their simulations, they were all growing very rapidly in mass. So almost, almost all of those things would have actually corresponded to something which was orders of magnitude more massive at late times. And what we, we care about are the ones which are still relatively low mass at, uh, at the present day, and because halos that fell in well, came part of the Milky Way before Redshift Five, will all of all, all have been uh, incorporated in, into the smooth component. They won't longer be they'll no longer be be subhalos. Okay. All right. Uh, so we have uh, another question from Ricardo Sturani. Ricardo, please. Hey, hello. So, very interesting talk. Thank you. And um, I have a couple of questions, if I may, from uh, actually a far away point of view. I don't work on this field. So, in the first slide, you show the um, the mass counting with the very large scales. I mean, a scale that encompass way beyond the size of a galaxy of the size of local Correct. group. So, so can can you really? So yes. So, so for, formally, this is the the yeah. way to think about this is this is formally uh, the cross correlation between the position of a galaxy and the projected density of material along the line of sight. So you can measure that cross correlation uh, out to large scales, and on small scales, the cross correlation is due to the dark matter around the galaxy itself. On our larger scales, it becomes due to the dark matter surrounding other galaxies that are also clustered to the galaxy at the center. So you, you, you can really reach those scale of a cluster of galaxies because you were reaching say 10, 20 megaparsec if I were Yes, yes, well, you saw the size of the error bars. Yes, you, you can reach that. But that's because you're stacking very large numbers of objects. You know, there are tens of thousands of objects stacked in each of those profiles. 
sorry, remind me. The conclusion is that for that such size for uh, the, the dark, so the dark matter around the like around the Virgo cluster. I mean, can we infer something? Well, no. The way to think about it is that the this what I showed you was the prediction right, for the uh, for the projected dark matter distribution surrounding galaxies in the simulation for this particular galaxy formation model was a very good fit to the observed distribution. So the so what it was just showing is that that if taking evolution from the Planck initial conditions, evolving only the dark matter forwards. And then putting galaxies into the centers of dark matter objects according to some physically based recipe and tuning, tuning the parameters so you fit the abundance of galaxies, the numbers of galaxies as a function of their masses and colors and so on. That then produces, that, that algorithm produces something which when you treat it in the same way as the, as the data, produces a very good agreement in terms of the cross correlation of the mass with the galaxy positions. So impressive at least to me that i never seen these results before and then if i may another question uh completely unrelated so you you show in the results for very small scale and you know, for very subgalactic scale down to the parsec yes. is mm -hmm. there any way to understand qualitatively the result or analytically even better i mean we would like to have a, a kind of independent test of the numerical result um there are analytic methods that work right at the very limit, close to the coherence length of the, of the initial mass distribution. So for the cold dark matter case I'm talking about, that would correspond to Earth mass. For a warm dark matter particle, it might correspond to the mass of a dwarf galaxy. Um, because uh, you can treat analytically the first collapse of objects. But uh, after the first collapse, then there's a very complicated hierarchy of mergers all of which are very nonlinear interactions. So there's no, the people have try, tried to take thermodynamic approaches, but they, they don't really work because you don't approach any therm, any sort of real thermodynamic limit. And so there isn't any good analytic way to treat the case when you're away from the very first objects, but uh, still nonlinear. So you're telling me that w when you go to the, such small scales, not only it's, also it's, also, it's, all, it's also true on the big scales, we don't have, a good analytic understanding for why the dark matter distribution of a galaxy has the particular density profile it does. Sure, sure, no, but I mean, the, the key, the qualitative ingredient that you're missing is to take care of um, remerger. I mean, things collapse and then merge. Yes, it's a copy. I mean, you you have you can think of it as a kind of tree where things of different masses come together and merge, and when things merge, the things that merge in are, are sometimes only partially destroyed. So most of their mass might be added to the to the main component and the center of the object may continue to orbit as a small substructure. So that's why you get these small lumps inside the big lumps. But you have to realize that for those small lumps, actually most of the mass they originally had has been torn off by tidal effects and is now distributed smoothly. And so you have to, to somehow come up with a, it's, it's, you know, this is a sufficiently nonlinear process that no one has come up with a, a, a realistic model which can predict the nonlinear density structures that come out. So you, you're telling me that the quality of the merger is both responsible for accreting in, into one single object and producing and producing crumbles, basically. Yeah, well, you have both mergers and effectively smooth accretion. Both things are happening. And at late times, it's mostly mergers because most of the mass is kind of in, in th objects that are already nonlinear. So you can think of it as them merging. At early times, most of the mass is still diffuse. So then it's more or less diffuse accretion. So as the, as the growth of structure proceeds, you proceed from it mostly be do, be, being due to uh, smooth accretion to mostly being due to mergers of objects that have already formed. I was worried if, if the mergers can also uh, be responsible for disruption of of parts yes. of the of the, the initial uh, ingredients. Yes, they, they do. I mean, they, re, they they cause a major restructuring. But there's there's essentially a sort of convergent behavior that uh, these kinds of hierarchies of mergers, that, at least for the kind that seem relevant in cosmology, seem to produce a more or less universal structure for the dark matter objects. So there's a kind of convergence. But people have not done very good, have not been able to really come up with a good theory, a convincing theory that explains this. It's just a numerical result at the moment. But it's, by this stage, it's very well established in the sense that many people have done it using very different numerical techniques and they all get compatible answers. At least 
when you only consider the dark matter physics, the baronic physics is more complicated. Right, uh, I don't see any other questions. So maybe I'll ask the last question. Uh, so as you said before that, uh, the result of your investigation was that we'll probably see the, the main cluster much before the any, any uh, halo, the main halo much before the any sub halo. So what, what, how do you expect we'll, we'll, we can see? So what, what will happen? Is there uh, some... Well, what, I, well, another way you could look at, I mean, so, so what the, has been seen by Fermi, either it is the annihilation radiation or it's something else. So if it's something else, it's an upper limit on the annihilation radiation coming from the main component. The, 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 if, if there is annihilation from the main component, it must be, say, at least 10 times less than, than what you're seeing, assuming that's not it. So now if we take my, my factor of two times 10 to the minus four, there's an upper limit on what we can expect to see from any of the other objects, which is now way below the various claims that people have made of possible. So the, the claims that people have made for the small objects are not, you know, if they, if they were true, then I would say the, the, the main object has to be the gamma, the annihilation radiation because we expect this very large ratio between them. So what we know about the annihilation radiation so far is that the radio profile is approximately correct. It's much closer to circularly distributed on the sky than distributed along the galactic disk. So if it's something to do with stars, it has to be a population of stars, which is not confined to the disk, but is distributed like the more spherical component of the galaxy. And it has a spectrum. I mean, they know something about the spectrum and the spectrum is at least compatible with annihilation radiation. But those are basically the only things we know about it so far. And, you know, we're not, this is already 14 years of Fermi data, so we're not going to get any more from Fermi. It'll have to be a, another telescope if we're going to do better. Maybe with better spectral resolution in the gamma rays, we could find a feature or something which would we could relate to some property of the annihilation radiation or to another process if that's not it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Simon, for a very interesting talk. And uh, I don't see any more questions. Once again, thank you all for being with us and we'll have more seminars next week. Thank you. Recording stopped. <laughs>